Hello again, glad to see you decided to continue on. Today we are going to be furthering your foundational programming skills. Let's start off by talking about how you should organize your projects. As I am going over how I organize my projects, if you think of any changes or additions you would like to make to the folder structure, feel free to do so. Let's take a look at my folder that stores all of my plugins and anything else to do with Bucket. My plugins folder is located on my desktop and this is my working environment. In here I have directories for storing APIs, using build tools, storing projects, test servers, code snippets, and more. First let's take a look at my projects folder. In here I have all of the projects I am actively working on. When I am finished with a project or lost interest, I will move the project from this folder to my archive folder. We will return to this folder at a later time to discuss storing miscellaneous information for projects. If we head back up a level and take a look at the APIs folder, you will see all of my implementations of the Bucket API as well as APIs from various different plugins. In my Build Tools folder, I keep a version of Build Tools for every game version I work on. I only started doing this recently, so I currently only have three. If you do decide to do this, make sure you update your buildtools.jar file regularly. If we head on over to the snippets folder, I have a few snippets of code that help streamline the development of plugins. This is also something I started doing recently. If I want to use a snippet of code, all I have to do is drag the folder into my project and change a couple of lines. The final relevant folder in my working directory is my test servers. I keep a test server for each version I work on so I don't have to create a new one if I need to go back and work on an older version of the game. This is essentially everything I use to make bucket plugins. I have spent a lot of time coming up with this system and I like this one a lot. I am constantly changing and adding things to its structure as time goes on. Enough about organization. Let's discuss debugging. Debugging is the process of identifying and removing problems from your software. As you program, you will run into issues. Something may not work correctly or the program may not even build at all. To help solve this, most well-made IDEs have a debugging tool. The debugger allows you to step through your code line by line as the computer is running it. This allows you to see exactly where the error is and help you further identify the problem. Let's practice debugging. I have a link to the project I will be debugging in the description. If you would like to follow along, which I highly suggest you do, you may download it from there. If you need some help opening up the project, follow along as I do now. Remember to add bucket as a dependency or your project will not function properly. There are three different types of errors, syntax, runtime, and logic. A syntax error is when you use improper syntax. Let's define syntax. Syntax is a set of rules you need to follow when programming. So if you forget a semicolon at the end of a line, or use single quotes instead of double quotes around a string, this would be a syntax error. The next error is the most common, runtime errors. A runtime error occurs when your program is running. Let's say you put an integer where a string is supposed to go, you will encounter a runtime error. A logic error is typically the most difficult to debug. A logic error is when your program runs incorrectly. It runs, but the outcome wasn't what you expected, such as forgetting to save a file after editing it. Don't worry if you had trouble following along, I will provide examples now and walk you through the process of debugging for each type of error. Don't worry if you don't understand what some of the methods do, focus on understanding the process. This is what a syntax error looks like. The built-in compiler in IntelliJ identifies and marks these errors for you. The compiler or interpreter is able to detect all syntax errors, although it is sometimes possible to get a false positive, it is not very common. To see what the error is, move your cursor over the part underlined in red. It says, 
too many characters in character literal. Well, what does that mean? Because I'm familiar with syntax in Java, I already know the solution. But let's say you didn't know what the solution was. How do you find it? You have to look online. Lucky for you, there is an easy way to search most of the internet. Google. So let's head over to Google and solve our issue. I'm going to start by adding the word Java to my search, as this is a Java syntax related issue, it will help filter out unwanted results. Next, I'm going to input the error word for word so I have the best chance of finding the solution for my scenario. Sometimes you will find the solution right away and other times you may need to look at 10 different resources. I'm going to start on the first result and work my way down. If I still can't find the answer, I will try to modify my search to have a more specific description. Most of these results are for C Sharp, which still apply to Java as it is a C based language. It is not identical in every way, but in this case it is. As you can see in this article, it says I am getting this error because I am using single quotes instead of double quotes. The reason something like this will not work is because single quotes mark that the data type is of a character, which is a single letter. A string is a different data type, it is a collection of characters, so I need to add double quotes to my string instead of single quotes. After making this small change, you will see the red line goes away and our syntax error is solved. This next example is the one you will be dealing with the most, the runtime error. Unlike a syntax error, the compiler cannot detect a runtime error, so let's build our project and run it on a test server. But we aren't going to be running it from a batched file, we are going to be running it through the debugger on IntelliJ. If you don't already have a testing environment set up, I will have a tutorial on a card on screen and a link in the description. First, you want to click up here on the top right of the screen where it says Add Configuration or go to Run Edit Configurations. Click on the plus icon to create a new configuration and select JAR Application. You may rename the configuration if you would like. The path to JAR field should be the path to the bucket implementation you are using. I am using Spigot, so I will select my Spigot JAR file. If you're using Craft Bucket, feel free to select Craft Bucket. In the program arguments section, add no GUI. This will make it so we don't get a second console window popping up. Next, you want to select your server folder in the working directory. This is the folder where all your server files will go. Finally, select the correct Java version and click apply. On the top right, make sure your configuration is selected, then press the bug icon to the right, or use the shortcut Shift F9. The debug window should open and you should see the console. Now if we run our command, we will get an error message in the console. This error message is known as a stack trace. It lets you know where the error is, where it occurred, and what the computer did to get to that point in the code. At a glance, it looks like a whole mess. Let me break it down to you into different sections that will help you understand it better. This is the first line. My screen is not very wide, so it appears on two lines, but it is indeed only one. The first line is the reason the error occurred. It says, unexpected exception while parsing the command test. Then it gives the error, which is command exception. The next few lines tell you what the computer was doing that caused the error. The blue text are classes in your program. The gray text are classes from external libraries or frameworks. In this scenario, there are no classes from my project in this section, but we will still talk about what is going on. The top line here is the most recently run method. Then it shows you what method called that method, and so on all the way down. So a method in the plugin command class was the method that threw the error, and it was called by a method in the simple command map class. We can see evidence of this by clicking on the simple command map line. Note the number after the word Java. You can see the method is tab complete, and the line that was run is the same as the number in the error. Now let's talk about the final section. Everything I just said, I lied. Kind of. Let me explain. Not all stack traces are equal. Think of there being multiple reasons for your program to be causing the error. They are all correct, but one is more helpful than the others. In this scenario, the bottom error is more useful to us because it contains classes from our project. So we can ignore everything we just talked about, the concepts still apply, 
we just want the second error. The line we want to look at starts with caused by. This is the real exception we are looking for. Array index out of bounds exception. What the heck does that mean? Let's ask our friend Google. I'm going to copy the error and paste it into Google. To understand this next part, you need to understand how lists work. A list is an ordered collection of the same data type. So let's say I have three strings, hello, goodbye, and help. And they are all contained in a list in that order. Each element in the list has an identifier tied to it. This identifier represents the position of the element in the list. Hello is the first element, so we give it the identifier of zero. The next element is goodbye, so it gets an identifier of one. The next element is help, and it gets an identifier of two. And this would continue on if you had more elements in the list. This number we assign to each element, which I have been referring to as the identifier, is actually called the index. So hello has an index of zero, and help has an index of three. Now, back to the error. Array index out of bounds exception. What does that mean? Let's go back to Google. It says, this error is thrown when a list has been accessed with an illegal index. Well, what is an illegal index? An illegal index is a negative number, or a number that is greater than or equal to the size of the list. An equal number would be illegal because the final index in the list is one less than the number of elements in the list because we start at zero. So let's look at the code. The variable args is a list of strings. This list is populated by a bucket. Every word after the command is an argument. So if I were to use the command game mode creative, creative is an argument and is added to this list. If I use the command game mode creative dev mclovin, creative and dev mclovin would be the two arguments. Creative is first, so it gets an index of zero, and dev mclovin comes second, so it has an index of one. When I typed my command earlier, I didn't include any arguments. So the size of our list of arguments was zero, which means there is no index of zero, which is the first element. Let's try running the command again, but this time with an argument. This time we don't receive an error and the plugin runs correctly. We will talk about how to solve this in the future when we talk about arguments. For now, let's move on to the next error. A logic error is a mistake made by the programmer. You forgot to do something or did something wrong. This can be the most frustrating because there are no tools to pinpoint the exact error for you. You need to locate it. So how do we do this? Let's take a look at the next example I created. Don't worry about the unfamiliar methods. Let's discuss what matters here. So I created a function named multiply. I expect this function to multiply whatever two numbers I input as parameters and return the product. However, when we run this code, you can see the numbers are not multiplied. This is an extremely simplified example, but pay attention to the concepts. What we need to do here is step through the code line by line to see where the error happens. To do this, we need to add a breakpoint. A breakpoint is the point at which the code will stop running automatically. Your program will be frozen in time at this point. Let's create a breakpoint in our method. To do this, simply click on the empty space to the right of the line numbers. You can create as many breakpoints as you want. To remove a breakpoint, simply click on it. If you try to put a breakpoint on an invalid line, such as a brace, it will turn gray and not function properly. Let's run our command now. As you can see, your code is frozen in time. You can use these buttons to navigate your code, or alternatively, you could use the shortcuts. We will only talk about the most commonly used functions here. Step over, into, and out. Your cursor is the blue line. This line is the line that is going to be executed next. Step into means you will step into the method that is going to be run. So on the line where we instantiate or define our number variable, we can step into the multiply method. You can see now your cursor is in the multiply method. Step over means you will run the current line and jump to the line directly below your cursor. If there is a method on the current line, you will step over the method to the next line. So if we were to step over the multiply method instead of step into it, we would not be brought to the multiply method. Console is no longer open. As you can see, we are in the debugger tab. The debugger tab shows you what variables are being used in the current scope. 
We will talk more about scope another time. This video is getting pretty long. You can see our x and y variables are passed in as parameters. So if we step over this line, we can see what the sum of the two numbers is, represented by the answer variable. Since this number is not what I expected the product of the two numbers to be, I know this line is where the error occurs. If this were a method, I would step into the method and continue the process until I reach the point at which the error occurs. To get out of this method, we can use the step out function to return to the previous method. Click on run to cursor to resume the program. Let's fix our error by changing the plus to an asterisk, the multiply sign. In this case, since we are running a bucket server, when we resumed the program, it crashed. The server thinks it froze when in reality, we paused it. To fix this, you want to edit the configuration you just created and add the following JVM parameter. You can copy this from the description. This is the time in seconds it will take the server to time out. The default value is 30. You can do the same thing on your client if you want to stay connected to a timed out server for a longer period of time. Congratulations, you now know how to debug your programs. This is one of the most important skills of programming. You will be doing this all the time when your code doesn't work. It may not seem like much, but this is a huge milestone. Next time, we're going to be making more advanced commands. With that said, that is all for today, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.